The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jill McCarville. I'm the VP of Marketing here at iWave, and we're very excited to have you all joining the webinar today. We'll um, do a couple of housekeeping items here to get started and hopefully give everyone a couple more minutes to join uh, before we hand the mic over to David. So we're very excited to be hosting David today. He's a well-known um, industry expert and one of our uh, iWave partners. And having him on the iWave webinar series today is a real honor. So we're very happy he's here with us. He is the co-founder and CEO of NewSci. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping items to get started before we go. First, uh, David will be discussing why we need to go beyond wealth to grow and retain donors. He will aim to leave around 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions. So please feel free to submit your questions as we go using the chat feature. Um, and then we'll answer them all at the end. Um, we'll save that time. And if we don't have time to get through all of the questions by uh, two o'clock, or sorry, one o'clock Eastern today, then we will get back to you. David um, will personally get back to you over the next couple of days. Secondly, we will also be sending out a recording of the webinar. Uh, following this, and we'll send links to a couple of the studies that David is going to reference uh, through the webinar today. So before I turn the floor over, I would like to tell you a little bit more about David. Um, he brings 25 years of experience as an entrepreneur focused on providing actionable insights and technology to the philanthropic community. In 1997, he founded Prospect Information Network, or PIN, which became the largest wealth screening company before being purchased in 2004. In 2013, he co-founded NUSI LLC to bring artificial intelligence, big data, and cognitive computing to the philanthropic community. NUSI was one of the first companies to develop a commercial application using IBM Watson. David is a recipient of the Case Crystal Apple for Teaching Excellence and APRA Distinguished Service Awards. David is the author of Big Good, Philanthropy in the Age of Big Data and Cognitive Computing. David is also the co-founder of WorkingPhilanthropy.com and is chair of Domi Education, a business incubator in Tallahassee. And with that, I will uh, hand it over to you, David. Well, thank you very much, Jill, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for spending a little bit of your day with us. Uh, you know, as much as uh, I've been in the wealth screening business uh, my career, uh, what I've known from the beginning is the reason people give, especially at the at the bigger levels, is because of a much deeper uh, connection than just having the, the means to give. And that used to be a given uh, years ago. People, people knew that. But as more and more wealth uh, was out there, uh, um, as frankly, we tried to mass produce um, major gifts, uh, we lost a little bit of that. And I think that that has shown up in some of the retention rates that we've seen a steady decline. Uh, also where we see campaigns that while they may have reached their overall goal, individual elements of that campaign that may not have been as high profile, but were also important, actually didn't succeed. Uh, that was one of the more stunning board meetings I ever went to many years ago was uh, I thought everyone at the board meeting was going to be thrilled. They had exceeded their goal by I think it was about 20 percent. But what they were discussing were programs they were going to have to uh, shut down because they did not raise money uh, for them or, or enough money for them. And so what I want to talk about today is getting beyond wealth. Um, Obviously, that's important, but how do we get to those real drivers of philanthropy, which are going to be creating a connection between your mission and the passions and interests of the individual? Now, I recognize that still capacity is important. We can't do this with everyone, although I do think with some of the new technologies that are emerging, uh, with artificial intelligence, we are going to be able to do more on a mass scale in the middle of the pyramid. Um, so it's almost kind of the middle class, if you will, middle to upper class uh, of givers. But we're going to put that on the side. We're obviously going to focus more on where we're going after the, the bigger money. My goal today is to show you 
how to uh, often infer those interests and passions. Sometimes we'll, we'll actually be able to hit the nail right uh, on the head, but other times we're gonna have to infer it from the data sources that are available to you publicly. And uh, where I can, I'm gonna draw them right in back into, uh, into iWave. So with that, we will start with what are the three elements? So capacity, propensity, and affinity. Hopefully most of you and all of you know what these are, but for those that might not, obviously capacity is pretty uh, apparent, although that is the capacity to give. And that's different than wealth. Um, and often uh, when we use, let's say real estate uh, to get to someone's wealth, they actually may not have a lot of capacity. Uh, to give, even though they have maybe a nice home, but that home is, uh, you know, well, you know, it's getting better now, but for a while there, many homes were underwater in value. But capacity is that capacity to give. Propensity is how philanthropic are they? In this case, it's that propensity to give to anyone. So at this point, we're just looking at the ability to give and the inclination to give. And then the final piece is affinity. What is that interest? So obviously what you hope is that interest is in your organization. But as we're gonna talk about today, I think you need to get beyond that surface level of your organization and get down to individual elements to really grab that affinity, especially the bigger your organization or, or institution is. Now the magic is when these three things come together. Uh, it is true that people will give only to you. So they're actually not very philanthropic, but for some reason, sometimes this will happen with disease organizations. Um, schools also sometimes can take advantage of this. So they're not actually philanthropic, but they give to you. We especially see this around plan giving. So there are people who may not be philanthropic during their life, but one thing I've found that as much as some people may not like philanthropy, that's hard to believe, but there are some people who don't, but they like the IRS, uh, the tax collector uh, even less. So I have seen people who did not give during their lifetime, but they gave on their death. The most exa uh, famous example of that is um, Howard Hughes. So you can work with a couple of these elements. Obviously you could have someone that actually has less capacity than some of your best people, but they're very, very philanthropic and they love you. Often those people are people you should actually put ahead of people who are, yeah, they got a lot more money, but either they're not philanthropic or they're really just not you know, into your mission. And I too often see these people who in a way are begging to give you, let's say $100,000, but yet you're chasing the you know, one in a hundred chance for a million dollars. Now, uh, when at the end of this, uh, Jill will send out an email and she'll have a couple of links uh, to studies that I'm going to reference. Uh, the first one is this U.S. Trust Insights on Wealth and Worth, because, you know, we can say what we want about these people, but, you know, what's nice is when they tell us about themselves. You know, a lot of our life is, is sent sort of voyeuristically looking at high net worth individuals. So it's nice anytime we can get information from them. Um, first off, you know, it's interesting that, you know, 74%, which is a great number, but it's all, it is true that, like I was saying earlier, you know, that means that 26% don't give to nonprofit organizations. So the idea that money makes you philanthropic is actually a myth. In fact, uh, the studies show the most philanthropic people as a percentage of their wealth are actually poor people. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because if you're not doing well, you don't need to be convinced that others need help because you may need help or have been in that position. Um, so that's number one. Interesting though, how closely linked the, uh, those percentages that they do volunteer their time, their service. So remember, there's the term time and treasure. So that's one of the reasons that we're gonna look at where are they volunteering 
doing things like boards, becoming a class agent. Those are actually very important uh, items to measure. That next level, that serve on uh, boards, I think it's very interesting when you look at the 27% versus 74%. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, the fact that somebody doesn't want to sit on your board may not really be a reflection so much that they don't like you. It's just that they uh, recognize what it means to be on a board. Uh, and so I, I actually always am concerned when I see people on a lot of boards because they're probably pretty ineffective on all of them. Uh, also, more and more, we're seeing this idea of an impact investor. And we need to look uh, for those. That's a growing area. So these are people who invest in companies that support positive social change, environment. Uh, so it's kind of planet people first. Um, and we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, a lot of uh, your new entrepreneurs, you know, it used to be a term, I guess in a way, my career, I've been a social entrepreneur. I didn't think of myself that way until somebody kind of put that label, but I've always been in, in our space. Uh, but now, uh, you know, many people uh, will start their company with an idea of how, how can I be impactful? So we're seeing that on the investment side too. Um, the other thing is people do feel like just the creation of jobs and opportunities for others um, is part of their philanthropy. Uh, the work for a nonprofit you know, you might think, well, you know, obviously nonprofits don't typically pay that well and all that. So you kind of say, well, if the person works for a nonprofit, they must not have money. Well, that's not true. Sometimes because they have money, they're able to work for a nonprofit. You especially see that, of course, with um, inherited wealth, family wealth. So a lot of times when we find professions and they, who knows, they might be running the social media or whatever, don't always assume that that is a, ne is a negative on their wealth. If you're seeing other indications that they have money, yet they have this job that doesn't fit, uh, you know, 13% of them actually work for a nonprofit, so not as a board member. And then the final uh, type is another growing area, which is the social entrepreneurship, a social company. So think of this more as social enterprise. So a company that actually is involved in some way in either helping our sector or helping, let's say, the environment. And we'll talk about some of those uh, in a little while. Now, what's interesting when you think, why do people give back? across all of the different generations, you know, expressing personal values and that desire to make an impact is number one. So that's why you as prospect researchers need to be looking for what is it about our mission that we can connect to those personal values and that desire to make an impact. Um, you know, many times, uh, you know, over the years I've gotten to know high net worth individuals and I, you know, when I talk to them about their philanthropy and how do you approach it. And sometimes they'll say things like, well, I don't support my alma mater because they have a big endowment and they don't need it. I need to put money, you know, kind of where the rubber meets the road. Um, and then I explain to them the impact schools have in those areas. And then they go, well, I wish somebody would tell me that. That's not the pitch that I'm hearing. I, they're hearing the pitch. Well, you went here, you ought to give here. Um, or you have this degree, so give to this area. And so I think it's really incumbent on us to make that connection uh, with them. And then when we do, they're going to see you in a whole different way. Uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, about a third of the time, there is a sense of responsibility and obligation. And that's why, you know, when you kind of, what I call kind of guilt people into giving, uh, it works. I think it's, it uh, is not very effective for long-term uh, uh, retention. The tax benefit, hey, the reality now with the new tax bill here in the US is even less of a benefit. That just is not the driver. A lot of the super rich uh, can't even take advantage of all the taxes, uh, of all their giving. So they're just, you know, they make too much money. And then finally, that idea of access and status yeah, there are some people who absolutely will will give and be involved in your organization because, frankly, they want 
to rub elbows with the other people in your organization. But that's that's the the bottom uh, for all of them. Now, another thing to look at is, well, how many organizations do they support? You wish that they supported just you. Well, that's not reality. That would be like you're a restaurant and you, you, know, you have your, your best customers, but the idea that they never go to another restaurant is pretty absurd. Not surprisingly, the older you get, and this is from a 2016 US Trust study, um, the older you get, the more organizations you support. And this is the number of that they're actively supporting now. This isn't the number they've supported over a lifetime. This is the number that they are actively supporting. So as you get older, you tend to accumulate this. One of the things in prospect research is to try to figure out where do you fit in that group? Because it's not that the money is evenly spread. The top three will often get 60 to 70% of all the money. And so that might mean for an under 50, it might be one, and then might be two for the 51 to 70, and then three to four for the over 70. So when you're looking at other giving and you're looking at your own giving, looking at that kind of relative, uh, amount is really important. Now, having said that, something to always keep in mind, and this is just, you know, decades of looking at lists from every type of organization, every size, you know, you name it, I've seen it. People tend to give some percentage relative to goal. So be careful, your $100,000 gift believe it or not, in the donor's mind, might be equivalent to a million dollar gift to an organization that's much bigger than yours and has done bigger campaigns. So it's true that you you could be thinking, well, wow, there's 900,000 more for me to get. But from the donor's perspective, they may actually feel that they're equally working with both of you. So, but having said that, it is really important, where do you fit in to the organizations that that they uh, that they support. Now, where do they give their money? Now, remember I mentioned that rubber meets the road. Um, you know, 63% are giving for basic needs, so social service. 50% give for religion, and then so on and health. Some combination of these of these things. Now, what's interesting about that? So, 38% are doing some combination. Notice though that that means that a high percentage have actually picked an area and they're gonna focus uh, their money in their, that area. But I wanted, since probably many of you are in higher ed, I thought it was interesting that 31% of high net worth give to higher ed, but only 8% of their money goes to higher ed. So, you know, what, what I think that that shows is that higher ed, their focus often on a, let's say an excellence in education kind of pitch, rather than looking for particular projects and programs that would appeal to those, uh, you know, to their values, their passions, have gotten participation, but actually have not gotten the penetration into that wealth. So, you know, Religion obviously can, you know, that message can be very universal and, and, you know, can't get much bigger. And basic needs can also do that. I think higher ed has to get more granular. And, and again, often they can connect themselves back to things like basic needs. Um, in the late 90s, I was doing a talk for uh, Harvard and MIT. They, they get together to do joint uh, meetings. And Harvard had just come out with a brochure that was why give to Harvard when there's AIDS, pollution, homelessness, and so on. And when you opened up the brochure, there were all these alums that were actually working on those issues. And again, that's really what we've got to do. We've got to open up that mission and we've got to make those connections if we're going to increase the penetration. Now, another interesting thing to know is why does giving stop? Well, too many solicitations, right? So we've all heard that. Remember though, they've started to give. I think what happens here is rather than us figuring out why they really gave 
and what they're really interested in, we just keep going out with that general appeal and then they say, well, that's too many. Because followed by that is lack of impact. So they're basically thinking, well, I gave the money, but it, I don't see, we're not communicating that, uh, you know, where this is really meeting a need. And so I think all of these things are in, indicative of the fact that we have done, I think, too much focus on wealth and then connection to the organization. So like things like past giving and, and such. And I think where we'll start to see some of these numbers change, you know, when you say too many solicitations, what they're a lot of times what they're just saying is it's the same old stuff. It's not that they don't want to hear from you, but they don't want to hear a message that doesn't resonate with them. Now, I'll give you an example of this. So this is University of Toronto. And so higher education is not actually a primary interest in any way of Bill and Melinda Gates, but malaria, fighting malaria is. So suddenly you put that out there and lo and behold, University of Toronto gets a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That is obviously an extreme example um, with Bill and Melinda, but that's what we're trying to do, hopefully with all our donors, is we're going to try to get below the level, that top level, whatever our overall, I'm sure University of Toronto has some kind of you know, message that's around excellence in education or, you know, teaching the future, something like that. And some people will will go for that. Um, but often where the big money is going to roll is when you can say, what is something we're doing that we take that to the donor? Now, all of a sudden, the real money happens. Now, we're going to start looking at some of the different areas. Um, so we'll start with one that's not screening. This is just internal. But obviously, we need to look internal before we go external for screening. So what are the projects and programs that they gave to? So uh, I want to I want to not just look at the dollars. Too often I hear just, well, he or she gave X. OK, that's good. But where did where did they give? Was it restricted or unrestricted? So did they, did they you know, absolutely, are people who just give unrestricted dollars and, and wish you the best and trust you, but where, where was it restricted and what were those restrictions? Have they given multiple gifts? So, and that also could be, are they supporting, let's say your annual fund and the capital campaign? Uh, maybe there's events. What are different ways that they may have given to you? Uh, the amount of gift relative to potential. So if the capacity, let's say, is you know a million dollars, back to what I was saying earlier, they gave 100,000, well, then we've got a 10% penetration. So that's something when we're looking at like portfolio optimization, always like to take our screening results and look at that. In fact, if you don't do this already, I highly recommend that when you get your screening results back, you should have a snapshot of the moment before you start to implement your screening results. Where were you in terms of dollars for those people, who was assigned, all of that. So now that to save that. Then a year from now and two years from now and three years from now, compare what happened. And that will help you uh, see the value of screening and all of your good research. Uh, when was that last gift date? So how recent? And that, by the way, that last gift date, I also want to look at not just the amount, but what was that last gift to? Uh, we need to respect the fact that just, you know, these are just you and me with a lot more money. Um, they change over time. So, and especially uh, in higher ed, where you have potentially a lifetime with this person, we have to respect the fact that those interests are going to change, are going to evolve. So I want to look at last gift date and I want to look at what that program was to see if I'm seeing some change. Um, obviously, things like unpaid pledges, we have a lot of granular detail internally, so I want to look at that. And then I want to look at soft credits. Now, these are things that internally I can look at because as we get into external data, we're not. 
Now, before we move to that, I want to show you something um, that you may not be aware of, uh, or you may be living this. Uh, first off, only 62% of people work in a job that requires a college degree, even though they have a college degree. And only 27%, their major matches the actual profession they're in. And so that disconnect, when I hear people say, well, they had this degree, so they must be interested in that. Ah, you know, I think 30, 35% of the time, you're probably right. But two thirds of the time, you can't assume that. Um, I especially see this with uh, lawyers, by the way. Um, there are a lot of lawyers who don't actually like being lawyers, but they like other things, but they like the money from being a lawyer. Um, so I just, just, I think this is just important to have up there. Just, you can't make those assumptions by everyone. It doesn't mean that there aren't some people who start off with an interest and that takes them through their lifetime. But reality is a lot of people um, uh, are going some different direction. So what about external giving? So the obvious one is what type of organization or institution? So are they, uh, you know, are they cancer? Are they, um, you know, some medical research, disaster relief, that sort of thing. What's the size of the organization or institution? Is this a local organization, a regional organization, national, international? That scope becomes important because that also can help you as you're trying to figure out uh, how, like for instance, sometimes you need to make it very local. I worked with St. Jude many years ago and they, you know, they're in Memphis and they were trying to figure out how they raise money nationally. And what they did was they started talking about the protocols used by local children's hospitals. So that's how they talked about St. Jude, not St. Jude Memphis, but St. Jude protocols in your local children's hospital. The interest areas. So what, uh, so, you know, you think about the national taxonomy codes. Again, this is all going to be used to match back up to your missions and programs. Do you know any details? A lot of times when you get external giving, you just have that they gave a certain amount, some range, and they gave to the organization. You don't know the project or program you're probably not gonna know things like restrictions. When you do, that can be gold, of course, so that you know they not only gave to University of Toronto, but they gave for the malaria program. That's gold for external. Typically, we're a level above that. And then, of course, the type of gift. Do they give annual, a club level, capital planned? What's nice about that is obviously that can help you decide if, you know, clearly if somebody has made a plan gift somewhere else, they are a higher probability that they will give a plan gift to you if you can build the affinity and obviously they have the capacity. Um, you know, wills are changed right up to, you know, even the deathbed. So, uh, you know, there are many stories uh, with plan giving of people, of organizations right towards the end of someone's life coming in there that's why, by the way, you should keep your plan giving mailings going even when giving has stopped for those people who consistently gave until they got into retirement age. Because, uh, and this has, what I'm talking about now has more to do with not the ultra high net worth, but the people who have assets when they die. Uh, I mean, I've seen many stories of people who stopped giving, let's say when they're 65 or 70, and then they die, let's say at 90 and leave a million dollars. And then in their note, you know, you meant so much, but to us or, or my spouse, uh, but they needed to, they were worried about their own income. And then the gift itself, the amount, but I wanna also look, when I look at donation data, I wanna see, have they given to this organization year after year? So it's easy when you go into looking at this data, and, and I realize sometimes, you know, data can be every color, it ends up being white, it can be mind numbing. And what we miss is, is there a history, so a loyalty. So if I see that someone's been loyal to another organization, that means they are a loyal donor, which means if I could somehow get them giving to us, 
I've got a chance to keep them for a long time. And I think those are people that we need to we need to flag. I also like to look at that first and last gift date uh, in there. I, I like to see kind of those years. Um, but again, back to what I was saying earlier, beware of very old uh, donations. You still want them, but those interests could well, the older the gift, the more that that gift might have changed. Another one, by the way, to watch out for is obviously memorial giving, um, because a lot of that is a one time. Now, having said that, about half of memorial givers, if you solicit them the second year, will give again. Um, so it's not like they're all like, let's say you gave to a medical center that treated your parents. It's not that you might also, hey, I'd like that medical center to be there for me, so I'm gonna keep giving. But it is true that memorial giving is not a one-to-one -one where the fact that they gave means they're really interested uh, in your organization. Now, what about involvement, both internal and external? Well, this is where we start to look at things like leadership, the boards, the committees, have they been a class agent? These are, these are important because this gets into, remember, one of the areas we're measuring is propensity, right? So are they philanthropic? A sign that this person is looks at uh, philanthropy as a priority is the fact that they're taking leadership positions. Now, volunteering is very important, both internally for you to see, but also if you see that, that they're out there for other organizations, because there is a real correlation with that in giving. And then even event attendance, I always say though, be careful with event attendance because even an RSVP that they're not going to attend, I would actually flag that at the same level as an attendee because they took the time to tell you that. Um, it's why I always, like even people who give, send you the change of address, uh, nobody you know, says, hey, here's, here's my new address, don't ever contact me. Uh, and I do think that as we move, thanks to GDPR and all the privacy legislation being talked about, or even just privacy in general, I think we're going to get more and more into an opt-in kind of philanthropy environment. So uh, anything where they are going to interact with us and give us information is really important. But the stats show, shocker, volunteers tend to give more. So to me, the obvious, oh, volunteer. But this is also another clue. Who knows more about your mission than a volunteer, right? Now you're letting them in on the inside. So if you, let's say Red Cross and, and you volunteer in disasters, you're on the inside. You know how hard it is to deliver uh, disaster relief and how meaningful it is to the people that, uh, uh, that it's applied to. So again, to me, what the volunteer has done is they've gone and made a more visceral connection to your mission. But that to me is proof of why we've got to find those connections and try to make them. Not everyone's going to volunteer and have that intimate of a knowledge of what, uh, what our mission does. Now, inferred giving interest. So let's say you have something like bird watching you can start to infer like conservation, wildlife protection, the environment. Now, want to be clear here. When you infer something, you can also be wrong. There could certainly be, I suppose, bird watchers who don't care about conservation and wildlife protection and environment. Um, absolutely. But I think there's some logical leaps that can be made. You know, international travel, if we see, could it mean that they could be interested in international politics and policy, immigration, international rescue and relief, especially depending on where they travel for that last one? I think that those are some inferred elements, but then as you get to know the person, it would be more if I was a major gift officer, I'd wanna know these things and I might bring up a part of my mission that relates to one of these areas, and then their eyes might get wide and go, ooh, that's really interesting. You know why, but I think we need to put that out there. Um, you know, one of the reasons I think we're all surprised is as we look at like the Facebook advertising and all this, you know, in a way, how easily we're manipulated. Well, part of that is because, you know, humans at a very basic level, we're pretty simple uh, creatures, and we all have uh, what are called uh, bi confirmed biases and confirmation biases. And so we actually have 
So that bird watcher creates a framework around that. And obviously they want places to go and that's conservation. They're more likely to read magazines where wildlife protection is mentioned and so on. And obviously international travel, you're more exposed to the issues. Now an art collector, obviously museums, but then arts education. And then interestingly, I remember working with Ducks Unlimited hunting, but it's also wildlife preservation, although it's preservation so that you can do more duck hunting. Um, but there's a lot of other things like wetlands and other elements. So some of this consumer data, which some of you may be acquiring different ways, um, it might just look at like, well, he's a hunter. Yeah, so you ought to know that when you go out there. I think we in prospect research need to start to say, well, that may mean conservation, so why don't you talk about this area? Now, life events. As I mentioned, we need to respect the fact that these people are people. And so when things like children happen, suddenly child welfare, K through 12 education become important. So we need, and, and what you wanna look for is you might look at the donation data and say, hey, you know, there's some kind of random prep school in there, that sort of thing. But it's not so random when you then look at their children's ages. So you start to correlate where they are. Now that also means that as those kids get into college and then graduate and go on, those might diminish. <clears throat> and if you're not K through 12, you've got a chance now to slip into that slot. Now the other one would be uh, uh, pets and animal shelters, humane societies. Uh, that sort of thing. I think that, you know, the kinds of pets that they own, the numbers, obviously illness, this is really big um, with disease research, prevention and treatment, not only illness for themselves, but for their family. And one of the things as we look at this kind of information is recognizing the fact that we may have been getting a lot of giving over the years, and now some illness strikes and their giving just changes priorities. And all of a sudden you go from maybe in that top three slot to maybe you don't drop completely off, but you, you go way down, but respecting why that's happening. That I think that, that we just need to put that context around it and understand because sometimes what they may be saying is, I'm gonna focus on you know the cure for Alzheimer's right now. Um, it doesn't mean I don't you know, love my school or I love this other charity, because the reality is if you stay with them, maybe you keep them giving, but at a lower level, keep them somewhat engaged, keep them informed, they may actually come back to you. Obviously disasters, disaster relief. I live in Tallahassee, Florida, so you don't have to tell me about hurricanes. Um, and then obviously people in the Midwest and you have tornadoes and out West you've got earthquakes. Um, so one just looking at disasters, but also where they maybe have been touched by that, you can almost assume that you're going to start seeing some giving happening uh, in those areas. Now, what about the profession? So the type of business they're in, can that lead us to some interest areas? So let's say they're a healthcare analytics company. Can we say they might be more tuned into medical centers? Could a waste management company be tuned into the environment? And by the way, you know, sometimes you think like oil, so they wouldn't be interested in, um, you know, let's say global warming. Some of the biggest donors to green energy have actually been the children of, uh, of people who founded the oil industry. So it's an interesting, um, and in a way, you know, trying to sort of make amends, if you will. Uh, you know, the type of clients. So again, if you're serving medical centers, does that mean you have more of an affinity for healthcare? Pollution abatement, does that give you some affinity for the environment? That's where we start to make some of these connections because what I'm afraid we do sometimes in research is we just say, well, we need employment. Okay, we have employment, check, and we move on. And I'm like, wait a minute, that employment might actually be telling you something. And remember earlier, I mentioned things like impact investing, social enterprises. You know, I want to go look at the company uh, that they're part of and are they philanthropic? Do they have any 
you know, uh, you know, buy one, give one? Do they are they do they support volunteering? Is there something um, in their business model? Uh, most obvious would be if they're a B Corp, which is a benefit corp, and then they've put people in planet before profit. And then the location, um, that local and regional interest, look at the location and locations of the business, and that's often where you'll you could figure out, oh, that's why they give, because they've got a big division down there. Um, so that's, and the other thing is, what is the scope of the business? Are they only serving the local area? Do they serve the regional area? And also national and international. So let's look at one, you know, so here we are in pro. So here's somebody who's a hydrologist, you know, at Pollution Liability Insurance Company. So can we make a leap there to say, okay, he's a hydrologist, he's with Pollution Liability Insurance, could we put in front of him something about the environment and I, or conservation? And I think the answer is yes, that's where you could start. Now, does it mean they, who knows, they could say, you know, I, I don't believe in pollution, I doubt that. Um, but again, we're all looking at probability and trying to get beyond that sort of united way general pitch. Now, what about international? So obviously, if they have real estate internationally, that starts to get us international affairs, international relief, recreational areas. So do they have a lake home? Do they have a home at the beach? Believe me, if they have a home at the beach, they understand things like global warming because they, the storm surge is getting worse, all of that. I mean, here in Tallahassee, you know, we're 60 miles from the coast. And you know we're we're looking at some of these maps that you know we could be oceanfront you know by the end of the century, so recreational areas is uh, again something where there could be um, a reason that that person would support uh, something in those areas, and obviously the farm, um, but obviously you get into animals potentially wildlife. Although I will say some wildlife preservation they might not be interested in because it could actually be hurting their farm. Um, and then again, location, getting at that local and regional interest. Uh, one of the things I always look at, I've, I'm sure you you all do this, but in case anybody doesn't, if I ever see, you know, the person lives in New York and all of a sudden I see a Palm Beach United Way, I'm going to immediately go down and see if they've got a home uh, down in Palm Beach. It's often the first clue that someone's starting to get second homes is actually showing, and it isn't necessarily going to be big giving, but some giving outside of where you, their primary residence. Now, what about board members? Now, board members, obviously we look at the interest area of the organization. We'd like to think that no one's going to join the board of an organization they don't believe in, that that's not uh, you know, a passion or interest because nothing's gonna take more of your time and often patience and at times money um, than being on a board. The number of organizations that they serve, remember what I said though, beware of the person who sits on a lot of boards. Um, sometimes that person, it's really just their name that they want on those boards. Um, but also I, I find that the person who, this is a big commitment. So if, if you have to compete for dollars with someone who's on a board, that's pretty easy. You know, I sit on their board, you know, I've had, because I, I serve, uh, I was one of the founders of a local business incubator and other people in town have wanted me to do things. And I can't because I'm with, I'm, I'm associated with that. Now the size of the organization. So one of the ways that you can start to see how sophisticated a donor is and how wealthy is actually what kind of boards they sit on. So as you kind of go up the food chain, if you will, um, that is a sign of capacity and propensity. So getting onto, uh, let's say, American Red Cross National Board uh, takes quite a bit more uh, capacity and kind of oomph and gravitas than let's say the local humane society. Even though the local humane society is terrific, and it's not that there aren't wealthy people who sit on those local boards, but I definitely look at that size of organization. In a way, you're you're having your your uh, colleagues and other organizations who you're vetting for you. 
And then the number of board members. One of the things, you know, how do people know each other? Actually, the smaller the board, the more likely they actually know each other. Beware of huge boards and assuming these people know each other. Um, I once did a presentation to American Red Cross National, and this was uh, right before 9-11 when, and then of course their uh, whole, uh, you know, the number of donors, you know, went up exponentially. And they were wondering if they could do a, a billion dollar campaign. And there were like hundreds of people in the room. <laughs> just like, how can you ever get anything done? And so what they're gonna do is just like what happens at a big school, they're just gonna create little clicks and maybe your person's in that click with it. But whereas in a small board, they all know each other. So let's take a look at very well-known person, but not junior. Let's look at Bill Gates Sr. And not a shocker, he's on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but he's also on this Washington Early Learning Fund. And that's like, what's that? And when you look at their information, um, you know, you see they've got contributions about $10 million, expenses of $14 million, you know, $8 million in assets. So, you know, a decent charity, but obviously not huge. Now, of course, you look over at Gates and, you know, we're sitting with $40 billion in assets. You know, it's just to me, it's always amazing when I look at living, um, living philanthropists and their foundations have gotten to this kind of size. It's, it's just um, you know, amazing before people really, you know, they gave money, but then they died and then it kind of grew over time. So when I look at things like, uh, like real side in, in pro, you see, and fortunately there's a strong relation between Bill and his dad. So that's good. Um, but you'll notice that it's the relationships are through board. He sits on the board of Costco and the Gates foundation, but that early foundation is not actually in real size. So that's why you have to look over at the boards for that organization, because look at these are the board members that are sitting on that early education. So even though it's not the Bill and Melinda Gates foundation, this is a group and probably you wanna to get to some of these people. And Bill Sr. is absolutely going to know these people uh, very well. Plus the way you probably will be working it is some of these people know Bill Sr. Now, what about foundations? Now, the thing is, are they a founder, donor, or non-donor board member? This is really important because founder, obviously, very strong correlation. They set the giving interest. Um, you know, their giving interest can last beyond their death so that they've said, you know what, we are always gonna focus on early childhood education and that's our mandate. When they're a donor, there's a strong correlation between the giving and the interest. And then when they're a non-donor though, be careful because while it's true that they're not going to sit on that board if they totally disagree, but drawing the conclusion that their giving interest, uh, their giving in their interest correlate one-to-one, -one, I think is, is a mistake. Um, at the very least, this would be one of their interests, uh, and then they're gonna have ones outside of this. Also something to look for with foundations is anomalous giving. So outside of the giving area, because what they do is they give board members a certain amount of money to give outside of the interest area or outside of the geographic area. So for instance, if I was to look at the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, their trustees absolutely believe in the mission, all of that. But again, these are gonna be people who I'm gonna be, I, I'm not gonna draw a one-to-one -one correlation between everything the Rockefeller Foundation is interested in, these people are. It's very prestigious to sit on that board. And while they're not gonna disagree, I, I'm gonna look beyond this. It's, it's a piece of the puzzle. Whereas if I look at Michael Dell and his foundation, which he, by the way, gave $940 million to in this year, I am gonna draw a very strong correlation between what that foundation gives to and, uh, and Michael and Susan. Now, what about politics? Now, it doesn't necessarily correlate to personal interest. People do give for access. Um, you know, we'd like to believe it's, you know, they care and ideology, but a lot of times it's just, you know what, 
I need to give so they'll return my call. So beware of that. Um, PAC giving though tends to correlate more strongly with personal interest. Part of that is you can give more to PACs, um, but also as I'll show you in a moment, there also are PACs that have very specific interest areas. So if we look at someone like Michael Dell, the fact that he gave to Ted Cruz, a Republican, if you've done research on Michael Dell, he actually is a Republican. And so he's a conservative. And so that you can, you can draw some conclusions. But Steve Ballmer, who is one of the key players with Microsoft, actually gives to both Democrats and Republicans. So you can't uh, draw that correlation as you're trying to figure out conservative, and especially in our polarized politics, you know, some of this is who do we sit together at the event and who do we not sit together. Um, so again, be careful. But then we look at the PACs and when you have things like Citizens for Cancer Awareness, well, now we can actually infer an interest area. Someone's not giving to that for that, re for, you know, access, whatever. They're actually supporting a specific area. Also, there can be ones where the PAC is for a particular ideology or some sort of values. Now, what about family? Now, parents can influence giving. Um, obviously, we're all influenced by our parents. Sometimes, by the way, it can influence polar opposite. Um, I remember meeting Stuart Mott, whose dad was um, uh, was the, the guy who uh, gave all the engines to, or made all the engines for General Motors. Um, his dad was super conservative, super conservative, and Stuart was super liberal. Um, and things like the ACLU and Amnesty International, those kind of groups. And so in that case, it influenced the son's giving, but in the opposite. But the other way is it actually can um, create a, a history of giving in a family. Also, children, as we were saying earlier, can influence the giving. What school? I remember with Michael Dell, when I researched him back in the 80s and early 90s, all the schools, all the prep schools, uh, he had twins, were just like, who, what school is he going to pick for the twins? And obviously, they were all hoping it's them. And then siblings. And by the way, in that same study, 21% have family traditions. So a couple other things before I'm going to uh, throw it open for questions. Look at your programs and interests. So these are just different areas of a school. And then when you go over into PRO, start to look at, uh, that's the NTEE, so the National Taxonomy for Exempt Entity Categories, and start to match up your projects and programs as if they were individual nonprofits. So that's, that's a way to think of it. So you say, okay, well, this project, how would I categorize this so now I can match it up to organizations. And then when we get in and we start looking at the propensity, affinity, capacity, now you start to see these scores. One of the things you'll do is you'll say a particular affinity, but behind the scenes, you can actually change that preference. And the other thing is, remember you can change your weights. So start as you're building lists, you know, especially when you get into the harder to raise money for programs, like, boy, I'm really struggling. Start to put more on affinity and less on capacity. And don't worry maybe even about propensity. Who are the people that they're just interested in? And then you'll find some line. And like I said, you know, I, I look at these giving pyramids and they're not pyramids, they're hourglasses. And I think the reason is we really struggle to get people to give in that middle range, that kind of 100,000 to a million, depending on your organization, that might be 10,000 to 100,000. But I think it's because we, we fail to make these connections. That's where we could get that giving, uh, make that giving happen. And now I'd like to throw it open for questions. Excellent. Thanks, David. Um, that was extremely informative. And I actually didn't realize that uh, wealthy volunteers give a lot more than the uh, people who aren't volunteering. So that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> we have one question so far, but please feel free to submit your questions uh, to us anytime. We still have a few minutes to answer any. And as we mentioned, we can do so afterwards. Uh, the first question here, David, do you see an uptake in the industry to shift 
this this shift um, of focus to interests, or has it always been the case that everyone has kind of been aware and um, looking to understand interests? Well, I think it depends on the sector. Um, remember, what what fools you with with that, like your kind of question, once once you really start that relationship and you're going to their home or their business, you're going to divine this, right, as you have the conversations. What we're trying to do is how could we do this with the data that we have before we meet them? How can we start to infer that to be better prepared? And also, could we put the right ask? Maybe that ask is through the mail or email. Um, and the right program is highlighted. And so I think the shift is to start to say, let like our annual fund, for instance, um, how could we segment that better? Uh, I think at the top end, I just think we need to give, you know, as much information as possible and be careful that we're not trying to force someone to give in an area that isn't really their primary passion. So I think everyone, you know, at the top has has known this. Sometimes it's political. If you're in an institution and has a strong dean structure, that that law school doesn't want to give up their law grad to the School of Public Health, mm -hmm. even though that's where the money should go. So what I've heard from people is it's easier to break down those barriers earlier in the relationship than later. Uh, because once it starts to become, and, and we have a, a famous example here in Tallahassee um, with Sarah Blakely, uh, who founded uh, Spanx, where she graduated from the School of, of uh, Communications. But that's, she's an entrepreneur, and she's especially interested in women entrepreneurs. And so they really have, were struggling trying to make a case for communications, but not such a struggle as you start to look at the School of Entrepreneurship that they now have. So I think some of this has been kind of p political. <laughs> um, at a, a nonprofit, the problem can be, well, there's a greatest need. And if that greatest need, that's what drives everything. You know, we need X. I don't really care what you're interested. This is what we need. And I get that and you need it. But I think we need to say you're taking them out of their comfort zone. And that may be a reason that you're not going to get as much. Not that you won't get a gift but it will explain why you didn't get as much as you could have. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, one other one here. One of the reasons people stop giving is perceived lack of impact. Do you have any strategies to help demonstrate donor impact to ensure overall giving doesn't drop? Well, I think the one of the keys is to understand the impact they're looking for from you. So the more that, um, because you might think, well, we have impact stories. And, and if you look on websites and, and uh, different communications, we're better than we used to be, uh, quite a bit better in just putting impact out there. The problem is it's now become kind of this menu of impact and find what's interesting. So I think, again, trying to figure out what is it? Is it, uh, you know, it, let's say it's school. Is it the scholarship? Is it scholarships for particular um, types of students? Uh, is it uh, how the school's helping society? Um, if you're a nonprofit, is it a particular constituency that you serve? So maybe you're an arts organization, but what they really care about is your work with disabled uh, children in the arts. So I think not just, I mean, if you have to sort of generically just get impact out there, absolutely talk about the good you're doing. But the more that we can create a connection between that impact and that passion and interest, that's huge. In fact, that's often what will start the giving is by just start with a story. Because what you're saying is, hey, with the last person's money, look what we did. With your money, we'll do even more. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. All right. Uh, that's all we have time for today. We uh, are just down to the hour. So if there's any other questions, we'll handle those individually uh, via email. But other than that, thank you so much, David, for being with us today, um, sharing this knowledge. I think it's so important to go beyond wealth and look at uh, the full picture of the donor. So those are some really interesting um, thoughts and points that you made today. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining. 
um, hope to see you on the next webinar as well. All right. Thank you. Thanks, David.